Thank you for yielding back. Uh, the gentleman from, is it Illinois? Um, Mr. Lipinski is uh, going to be recognized for five minutes as soon as he's ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for stalling there for a second. I was at another, another hearing. I just finished my questioning there. So I thank the witnesses for, for being here today. And uh, this may be a little bit of a repeat, and that's what we're trying to avoid here. But um, uh, I wanted to uh, make sure that I directly had you address some of these things. Uh, Dr. Hallinan, the uh, Basic Energy Sciences Advisory Committee, BSEC, recently released a report detailing which BES upgrade proposal should be prioritized. And I was pleased that BSEC recommended beginning construction on the advanced photon source at Argonne National Lab, which is located in my district. It's my understanding that your research has relied on APS. And so you could, could you talk a bit about your work that uses the APS and how it, upgrading it would advance both your research in the field of high energy light source research in general? Sure. Um, so the, the electron beam at APS is, and actually at all of our synchrotron light sources, is actually this, this long, wide beam. Uh, sorry, not the electron beam, the, the light, the x-rays themselves. And so if we want to do um, some of these advanced experiments, so some measuring dynamics, we're essentially taking movies, very rapid movies, and we need to have a, a point source. And so what they do now is they just block off the vast majority of the light that's generated by by these uh, light sources. Well, what the upgrades will enable is actually in, um, and, and so this is not, the actual upgrades is not my area of expertise. So I can't actually tell you a lot about the technical details of the science, but, my, but as I understand it, the, they're able to shrink that, that x-ray down to a point without having to block lots of it. And so they're, they're increasing the, what we call the brightness by 10 to 100, maybe even more times what it is now. Um, and, and that's what enables us then to, with this brighter beam, we can basically take, take faster frames of the movie, of, of, uh, of the dynamics of, of these structured materials. So whether, and and it, it doesn't only need to be applied to polymers. I don't, I don't want to give you that impression. That's, my research uses polymers. Um, and, and the theory predicts that there are these segmental motions that are on, on very small length scales and are very rapid that we, we want to be able to uh, look at experimentally to, to, to verify that, that the theory is, is um, predicting correctly, and then if we understand the fundamentals uh, from this theoretical and experimental standpoint, then we may be able to design faster uh, or, or better transporting polymer electrolytes. Um, I think the impact is, is going to be much broader than just polymer electrolytes for batteries. I mean, there are people doing research in, in biological systems, um, looking at DNA, looking at ribosomes. Um, there have been, there've been Nobel Prize, there, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2009 apparently was awarded for, for work at the APS. Um, and, but so what it's, essentially what it's going to allow us to do is, is look at faster and, and smaller um, with all, all the different capabilities. So um, I, think, I think I answered your question. Yeah, is, what about the, uh, in, in general, the uh, impact on international competitiveness for the U.S.? To, uh, to do this upgrade? I, I think it's essential. I mean, um, this is, this is a, a, a new breakthrough in synchrotron science, um, and it's really going to push the limits of what we can do, of the research questions, that, the, the scientific questions that we can answer. And these scientific questions, I think, are important for, uh, for several of our technological challenges of the country. Um, and we don't, you don't, I, I mentioned earlier, the, the personnel, the people behind this science, it's like if you gave a, a, a vehicle to a monkey, he wouldn't really make much of it. And so these beamline scientists are also crucial. And so if we don't upgrade, we're going to start losing some of our, our, our really great talent to these other countries, would be my concern. Yeah. Thank you. One other question I want to throw out there. The, um, I know you talked already about um, uh, energy storage. Uh, Jay Caesar is also uh, centered at uh, Argonne, is the Energy Innovation Hub model uh, the best way to pursue this type of research and other research? I just want to get a uh, reaction to, uh, to that, if that's the, the best way to do this and to continue on with other, uh, other research challenges that we, we face. 
Well, I am fairly well acquainted with uh, uh, Jay Caesar. I belong to their advisory board. And uh, this is uh, some sort of a, a large-scale experiment in trying to uh, do the basic science and then migrate all the basic science through all the steps that are required to put the final product at the door of uh, uh, commercial um, companies that may want to take that technology and uh, bring it to the marketplace. Uh, it is a remarkable thing. It's working very well, from what I can tell. Um, it encompasses activities from the chemical engineering that goes into the design of the system to the very basic uh, 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 teachings of uh, what one particle can do when the electrode gets charged and discharged. So it's the entire spectrum of activity that is concentrated into one organization under one head. Very good. Uh, my time has expired, so I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. The chair now recognizes uh, Mark Takano from California. Oh, well, I'd like to uh, thank the chairman of the Energy Subcommittee for allowing me to be here today uh, due to my specific interest in the sector, so I really appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am co-chair of the Battery Energy Storage uh, Caucus and have a particular interest in energy storage and what we can do as policymakers to support and spur innovation in this industry. Uh, California is making uh, large investments in energy storage, and in my district at the University of California, Riverside, uh, at the Center for Environmental Research and Technology, uh, they are working on uh, the local utility, they're working with the local utility to integrate battery storage, uh, as well as combining it with elect uh, electric transportation. Um, uh, we have heard from scientists and policymakers alike that there's often a false boundary between basic and applied science. To some, supporting basic research is an important role of government, while applied research should be left to the private sector. Yet, uh, this idea that there is a line that neatly divides uh, the two separate levels of research is not realistic, and it goes against our general understanding of scientific discovery and innovation. Would you agree with this characterization, this last characterization? And, I'd, uh, uh, and uh, why don't I ask that question first, and if you can briefly just address that, uh, each one of you. Uh, certainly, uh, to efficiently utilize our researches and our capital, our intellectual capital, uh, we have to focus on the seamless transition and end use. Uh, we don't want to be wasting our time making discoveries of materials that end up when they're combined into a battery are explosive and unsafe. We don't want to be doing that with solar fuels generators either. And the only way you can do that is if you actually build a system and then understand from the system level what the constraints are on the materials that go into that system, whether it's a solar fuels generator or a battery or a flywheel or any other type of consumer or industrial product. So to the extent that the use-inspired fundamental research has an outlet into practical implementation, there should be no boundary. On the other hand, uh, there is a discussion about whether or not taking it further than a demonstration and constraining it is the role best served by the government or is that role best handed off to private industry and I think that boundary is something that is uh, beyond where the technical expertise, that's more policy. Okay, great. Dr. Shearson? Yes, I will just simply complement the answer given by uh, but Nate. Uh, I just learned that uh, about 10% uh, um, of the um, cost of an actual battery goes into materials and 90% into manufacturing. So, you know, we have to uh, be able to bridge the gap between what we regard as fundamental research and applied research. Um, I'm afraid that companies may not want to take the risk of trying to take something from uh, the laboratory and try to produce uh, something under their cost into a final product. So uh, in my view, uh, Jay Caesar has managed to be able to bridge this gap and trying to make these boundaries disappear. Great, Dr. Brown. <clears throat> uh, I, I think, um, I think uh, the, the, we, it is important to focus on the, the, the key role that the government has in supporting discovery-driven uh, research. Um, and um, let me give 
an example, uh, which is that in the uh, pursuit of um, uh, superconducting material that might in fact solve some of these storage and transmission problems that we have been talking about, uh, there comes a time when, when perhaps one does need to look at a material which superconducts at uh, 100 millikelvin. And this material may in fact provide the intellectual breakthrough that allows you to then uh, compose a material that will become a, a practical superconductor. Um, so I would, uh, so I, I, on the other hand, I think that uh, the, um, the cross-fertilization of the motivation from discovery-driven research to, um, to um, uh, 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 use-inspired research is, is very important, such that those who are working in the discovery realm need to uh, have the ability to view some of the challenges that, that exist in the real, real world, world as well. So this uh, artificial barrier is, in fact, very unfortunate it, if it exists. Uh, on the other hand, we have to really remember to also support the discovery-driven uh, part of it, not to have it uh, um, uh, cast aside for not being practical. Yes. So, yeah, and I'd like to just emphasize that with a quick example, that, that, that there needs to be a balance between supporting these for-profit entities and, um, and basic science. And so I think a great example is the discovery of the MRI, which is, is widely used in the medical industry now, was originally completely driven only by a fundamental science question. There was no perceived application of that research. And so I think, you know, I, I just want to... I would like to moderate the responses with the statement that I think it shouldn't, while taking things to market is extremely important, it shouldn't be at the expense of basic science. Might, might I ask just a follow up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so would you, uh, the work uh, supported through the Basic Energy Science Program, would you agree that it's, a, uh, that it's a major example of how there is really no clear boundary between basic and applied science? Um, even if basic is in its title. I think that's a fair characterization in the sense that we don't know what the applications will be of many of the materials made or fundamental concepts that are supported by uh, basic energy sciences will end up specifically into an energy system in a consumer or in a generator's kind of infrastructure. So that's foundational research and its outcome and where it goes should be unconstrained. There are separate parts that are use-inspired uh, that I think should be properly constrained into things uh, that could be implemented and are devoted to, say, using elements that are not so expensive or so rare that you could never actually use them at scale for energy applications. There are still fundamental research questions, but it's constrained into don't give me an answer on a material that I can't possibly think about ever using. Give me an answer that's relevant to ones that I could think of using. And I think they're both important to, to founder. Dr. Scherzen. If I could address uh, the importance of uh, <clears throat> theoretical research, uh, nowadays, uh, we have the ability of throwing at a computer all the elements in the periodic table and begin to ask questions. And we said, what kinds of materials could possibly be designed in the computer that are going to end up uh, giving us the ideal material for an action application? And, uh, you know, I have been many times, and I'm sure that my colleagues are the same, that the computer produces something that we never thought of. And uh, there is a case at the moment of a material discovered by the computer uh, that is uh, very good in terms of allowing magnesium 2 plus to migrate through the cathode. And so uh, people at Jay Caesar are contacting one laboratory in the world which happens to have that capability. And then you can then val validate what the computer predicted and then do the experiment to find out whether that is a good one or not. So this uh, interchange between theory and experiment uh, is becoming to be crucial in order to discover new and more efficient materials for all sorts of applications. Fascinating. Dr. Bonham? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I, let me uh, return to a, a, um, a topic that I opened with, uh, which was uh, the nature of um, at and Bell Labs or Bell Laboratories, uh, which was a very interesting um, uh, institution where you had this uh, connection between truly fundamental science and uh, very specific applications. And so, um, uh, I think I actually worked there at, at a time, and I think it was a tremendous uh, inspiration, in fact, even though we were working on topics that were it, 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 truly discovery-driven uh, science, 
uh, we had the opportunity to talk to individuals who were working at a very applied end of it. And this actually uh, be be can become a motivating uh, factor. Um, and so I think basic energy sciences uh, has the opportunity to, to be the place where, where these um, uh, strands of, of, um, of uh, research actually connect to each other, uh, both the fundamental and the applied side. Dr. Halloran. Yeah, I would agree. I think that um, the, the questions that we need to answer are well defined by the applied side. Um, and then we can approach them from our, from our fundamental perspective. So for example, as an engineer, um, the reason that I'm interested in studying polymer electrolytes is that I recognize the, the massive energy efficiency gains we can achieve by transitioning to electric vehicles from, from conventional internal combustion vehicles, for example. But my research does not um, cover trying to put these batteries into a car. That's for, for someone else to do. So I think that I agree with you that, that there is not really a clear line between basic and applied in that. Um, we, get, we get the important questions from the applied side, and, and then we, we figure out how to answer them, I think, from the basic side. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the extra time. You're welcome. Doctor, I'm Chair recognized himself for five minutes for a couple more questions. Uh, Dr. Broholm, could you give us a general sense of how far we are from being able to, I know I'm asking you to predict the future now, <clears throat> how far are we from being able to really develop useful quantum computing systems and explain the materials challenges? Um, <clears throat> uh, so there are many different forms of quantum computing that are now being pursued, and I think that already shows you that uh, we don't know now which approach is actually going to become uh, the one that functions or which approach is. Um, the general challenge that uh, uh, one is facing there is that it is necessary in a quantum computer to allow a physical quantity such as a nuclear spin or a photon or a patch of a superconducting material to respond quantum mechanically to specific uh, conditions that are imposed. And it's important that the wave mechanics associated with quantum physics can unfold without loss of coherence until the quantum computation has actually been completed. And, and so having a quantum material that can respond quantum mechanically for a sufficient period of time is actually a first step towards quantum, to having a quantum computer. And as I said, there are a number of different materials platforms that are now being explored. Um, um, and I, I would say that I'm optimistic because of the excitement that surrounds the topic and the, uh, the talent that's being applied to it at this time. Um, but um, I think the time scale is one would be, it's, it's a folly to try to really pin down a time scale on that. And I think we should be thinking of that as, as, a, uh, as, as, a, as a vision that, um, uh, that needs a sustained level of research uh, of the type that I think uh, predominantly the government will, government will be able to support. I think you just said you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Doctor, and I want to follow up with that. What role can the DOE research program in BES and even in the OSCAR or ASCR program uh, within the Office of Science play in advancing this research? Is there, as you pointed out, this is really early stages, and it's very important to take that, uh, to take that approach. And so um, I think we're talking about the development of new classes of materials quantum materials that sustain quantum um, coherence um, for sufficient timescales to allow quantum computing. And so um, one, of the, uh, one of the key um, uh, approaches that, that uh, we need to take is to combine the, uh, the, um, th uh, the theory of materials with the synthesis of materials and the ability to measure those materials in order to uh, examine uh, the uh, viability of different classes of materials to function in uh, a quantum computing system. Um, and if I may, I would say that um, one of the key roles that I, I see of uh, the Department of Energy and Basic Energy Sciences is, is the provision of um, world-class facilities um, that can actually um, uh, probe the structure and the dynamics of quantum materials um, to, to determine their vi viability uh, in these purposes. And in my own research, uh, I'm using uh, the technique of, technique of neutron scattering to actually 
uh, visualize the quantum mechanical electro electronic wave function of the, some of these materials. Um, and in fact, it's in many cases the only method that we have uh, to inquire the, um, the quantum physics of these materials at the appropriate length scale. Uh, so I think the, the provision of world-class facilities uh, for this kind of research is, is one of the important roles of the Department of Energy. Thank you. Um, and you, in your exchange with uh, Congressman Takano, you mentioned looking for a superconductor fabric of 100 million... Millik. Millik. That's a very low temperature, 0 0.1 above the absolute zero. And my point was that that is something that we do in the lab, and it teaches, a, teaches us about the fundamental behavior of electronic systems, but we can then take that knowledge and develop materials that are practical at higher temperature based on the same uh, principle. And the connection that I was trying to make to uh, storage and transmission of energy, um, I, I didn't, while there was the discussion, I didn't quite have the opportunity to make that, but superconducting material, a practical superconducting material is um, a, a potential component in, an, in a large scale energy storage system where you could in fact take the energy being generated by, um, by a photovoltaic station and put it into a current in a superconducting uh, solenoid system uh, that will hold the energy for a long period of time without loss and can then uh, disperse the energy when it is required. So this is another example of there being a range of different potential technologies that we have to be pursuing. Is that because it's so low temp, number one, and number two, when it releases that energy, doesn't it generate heat? No, in fact, uh, it doesn't have to be low temp. And so this is what we're pursuing is materials that will allow superconductivity to persist at uh, very high temperatures. And um, once you have superconductivity, you have absolutely zero resistance. So imagine you can simply put the current into the superconducting ring and then just close the ring and the current will persist. Well, then when you charge it, it doesn't produce heat, zero resistance. Zero resistance, it just sits there. So as long as it, it is in the superconducting state, uh, and then you, when you want to release that energy for use, uh, that can then be done uh, as well. So it's a really quite interesting potential way of storing energy, uh, particularly for these intermittent and distributed energy, uh, renewable energy resources. Okay, and one last question. I'm going to yield to my good friend from Florida. Dr. Lewis, are you seeing discussions? I think in your earlier comments, you said most of the comments were coming from Japan, China, in your publication, about half of them. I didn't hear you mention Russia in there. Russia is noticeably absent. Uh, but are you seeing these kinds of discussions in your publication? Um, we don't see much from Russia. But I'm not Russia specifically, but qu the quantum part that Dr. Broham is discussing. Uh, um, not particularly much. Uh, most of the discussions are focused toward um, solar, wind, storage, right. and uh, more use-inspired things that would be true to the energy and environmental. A science absolutely. Title. So, Dr. Broham, do you know of publications that are that are discussing uh, the superconductivity that you're discussing in, uh, in a quantum fashion? Are there is that is that discussion being held worldwide? Yeah, it's it's a very active area. Um, uh, Countries around the world are putting in effort to try to discover uh, a practical superconductor, and there are advances uh, being made, um, and we're very optimistic that we'll be successful. Okay, and then Dr. Helen, and lastly for you, since I come from a from a district that has a lot of what we call Petrotex chemical industry, petroleum and, and other chemical industries, when you're talking about polymers, of course, you're talking about uh, something that kind of gets my attention. Are you also hearing that discussion on a worldwide basis? Regarding uh, polymer yes. electrolytes and uh, sh yes, absolutely, um, and and we have been for for uh, for decades um, be because they can fill many different roles. They can they can fill hydrogen fuel cell roles. They can fill um, artificial photosynthesis role. They're they're, they're uh, batteries, water purification, and so they're definitely uh, publications from all around the world. Um, yeah. So. I, okay. Who would you say? What country is is our, our runner-up, if you will? Right. Was doing the most. You're hearing the most from. I would say probably Italy actually is the runner-up to the United States in terms of polymers and and um, for for membranes, yeah. all kinds of polymer membrane applications. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I yield to my good friend from Florida. Thanks. A few questions for Dr. Proholm uh, regarding superconductivity. 
Doctor, join me in our time machine. We, we're jumping back to 1986 and the discovery of the possibility that you could have much higher temperature superconductivity than anybody had ever realized before. People thought that anything above 30K, uh, 30 Kelvin was impossible. And now suddenly 70, 80, 90 is possible. Nobody knows exactly how high you can go, maybe as far as even room temperature. Nobody knew three or 30 years ago. Well, here we are 30 years later, we still don't know. What should we have done 30 years ago to try to pin down the possibilities and get that science done? I think the point here is that these are extremely difficult problems. Um, uh, despite the supercomputers, despite uh, the advances in, in uh, theory of electronic systems, uh, really no one would have predicted uh, that a material such as iron, selenium, just two elements joined together, uh, can actually be a superconductor, in that case uh, uh, at relatively low temperatures. Um, no one would either have been able to predict that when you place a single atomic layer of iron selenium onto strontium titanate, uh, you actually can greatly enhance the superconducting transition temperature to 50 Kelvin uh, in, that, in that system. Uh, and again, it, it's something that, that even the smartest uh, theorists at this point uh, are not able to, uh, to really predict as an ab initio, kind of as a, as a basic, um, uh, basic prediction. Uh, so I think that the, the statement is that these are simply extremely uh, complicated problems um, because they involve the interaction of a very large number of, of electrons uh, amongst each other. On the other hand, they're also very, very rich um, sets of materials uh, that give the ones of us who are working in them uh, a sense of amazement and a sense of uh, optimism in terms of uh, the kinds of properties that we will be able to extract from these materials uh, as we advance our understanding. So I think we have to take the long view as we look at these properties. It's as true today as it was in 86 uh, that there is potential for us to create uh, uh, superconducting, practical superconducting materials, not necessarily at room temperature, but practical uh, for our use in energy and information. So what should we do right now to bring the future forward and make that scientific discovery happen sooner? I think a lot of things are being done. Um, I, I think perhaps um, what I would advocate, uh, we talked about a little earlier, is the close um, interaction amongst scientists that, um, uh, that have different uh, perspectives on materials, different techniques and different ways of thinking about materials. Uh, this tends to be a very fruitful exercise. So what appears to be a, uh, a brick wall for a um, condensed matter physicist, a chemist may have a different way of thinking about the material that allows you to really uh, 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 tunnel through that, uh, that challenge. And so I think bringing together people who are experts in synthesis, people who are experts in theory of materials, and people who have um, uh, innovative new methods to probe materials, uh, that, this is the way, um, uh, that this is the way that we can best uh, make progress on these very complicated but very promising areas of materials development. Thanks. I yield back. Well, I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions from the, the members. This hearing is adjourned.